I'm going to tell you how 50 engineers on a shoestring budget and a different mindset built a jet that could break the sound barrier. On Jan 28, 2025, Boom Supersonic, which is an American company founded in North Carolina, built a test jet called the XB-1 that traveled at Mark 1.1 and is an example of a civil aircraft built for commercial airline purposes, much like the Concorde, but with a few differences. Now, I figured if a company could build a supersonic jet with a handful of engineers and one-tenth the budget of what it would otherwise take an aerospace company to build something like this, what could the chip industry take away from this experience? Hey, my name is Vikram Shaker and welcome to the channel. I write a Substack publication called Vix Newsletter where I write a whole lot of stuff about semiconductors and also share all my experiences from working 15 years in the chip industry. If you want to sign up for that, check out the link in the description below. Now on with the video. Boom Supersonic was a very interesting company to me because their engineering approach to building a supersonic jet was very different from what I had seen before. Making something as complex as a jet engine and an entire aircraft that can safely travel faster than the speed of sound is no easy feat. Boom Supersonic's supersonic jet is actually called the Overture and is designed to fly at an altitude of 60,000 feet, which is so high that you can actually see the curvature of the Earth from that altitude. Boom describes their technology as boomless supersonic flight, which is strange considering the name of the company itself. The way Boom Supersonic's flight is boomless is because they fly above a certain altitude where the shock waves created by going faster than the speed of sound is refracted within the atmosphere and never reaches the ground. So you will not hear any sonic booms if you're in your living room watching TV. But what actually struck me was that there is an enormous amount of similarity between supersonic jets and chip design. Both are incredibly complex and have to navigate complex design spaces. Both take an enormous amount of time, money and people. And interestingly, both have outdated workflows where people work in silos, which typically extends project timelines and budget way beyond what is actually necessary. Now let's talk about legacy workflows. There is something to be said about a workflow designed for the 1980s that's still being used in 2025. EDA tools, much like aircraft design, hasn't really evolved for the last several decades. And it typically involves one group designing a certain block, handing it off to the next group, and so on and so forth. Now, within each process of this workflow, there is significant padding of timelines and the optimization does not occur across the entire product. As a result, a lot of performance is left behind on the table. This linear approach of designing a product gives a lot of traceability, but it takes away a lot from parallelism and overall system optimization. The fundamental paradigm that Boom adopted to break out of this workflow was invent together. And while the invent together workflow requires hiring great talent, there's a little bit more to that. And Scholl explains this in his Substack article. At Boom, every engineer is expected to code and to leverage AI. We have taken the unconventional approach of embedding software engineers, typically with high curiosity, but little or no aerospace experience directly within our hardware teams. Especially in the context of Boom Supersonic, they designed an in-house software suite called MK Boom that allowed them to optimize their engine design with the cabin design so that the range of the Overture jet could be optimized with all system design parameters in mind. Now, the only way this could be done was because the software engineers sat down right next to the hardware engineers and they work together to optimize the entire system. MK Boom is equivalent to a company designing their own EDA suite that works really well with the products they are actually designing. 
Now, I have never seen this being done in a chip company. The mentality of optimizing software with hardware doesn't really exist for the sake of chip design itself. The EDA toolkit is dominated by three or four major companies. And maybe it's just not possible to do this in the chip world, but it seems like there is a resistance to developing software in-house in hardware chip design companies. Things are changing significantly with the advent of AI in chip design because companies have started to realize that machines and especially software can help them explore vast design spaces that were otherwise not possible by human intervention and experience alone. So we have a wave of AI companies that specialize in hardware design, especially for the chip design world, who are leveraging AI to intelligently design chips in the shortest time possible. I'm really excited to see what comes out of this. If you've ever worked with EDA tools in the chip industry, you'll see that the UI and the general user experience is very poor. And typically, working with poor tools gives you a bad taste, which means you don't really iterate enough. The final point I want to leave you with is that if a design tool is a pleasure to use, and if it's easy to iterate on, then designers of whether they're supersonic jets or chips would be inclined to iterate more on it. And the more designers iterate, the likelihood of emerging with better innovations, newer ideas, better designs gets more probable. If you are an EDA design company watching this, please make your design interfaces a pleasure to use. We really want to make chip design enjoyable again. Maybe the semiconductor industry can then unlock its own supersonic leap ahead. All right, thanks for watching. Catch you on the next one.